I'm Keith Ari, the Candido, and welcome back to the latest episode of Crad COVID Readings. Well, not welcome back, welcome to, whatever. Anyway, um, having last time done my first ever Dragon Precinct story, short story, this time I'm going to do my first Cassie Zukov story, which is going to be a little different. Um, throughout this reading series, I've done several of my Tales of Cassie Zukov Weirdness Magnet. Uh, but my first story featuring Cassie did not take place in Key West, was before she found out she was one of the DCR, and um, also, well, as you'll see, uh, it's not a story that leaves itself open to more stories, and yet I've done more stories. Go figure. I also have a cat. Hello, Louie. Louie wants to help me read. Um, come here. Say hi to everybody, Louie. Come here. Come here. Come here. Ha ha ha. Louie. See? Cat. Anyway. Um, back in 1997, uh, the late Josepha Sherman and I put together an anthology called Urban Nightmares, which was published by Bain Books. This was an anthology we conceived uh, in a hotel bar at a convention, which is where a lot of um, anthologies were conceived. <laughs> um, and I, honestly, the, 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 the first book that had my name on the cover was called Other Weir, and, uh, by me and Laura Ann Gilman, and it was conceived in a hotel bar. Um, at a convention, and Release the Virgins, which uh, I contributed a Dragon Precinct story to, also had its first uh, conception in a bar in a hotel at a convention. The idea of Urban Nightmares was one that Josepha and I came up with, uh, taking advantage of uh, Josepha's interest in folklore. She was a professional folklorist, and she thought it would be cool to do stories that were based on urban legends, alligators in the sewers, that sort of thing. Um, each of us also wrote a story and the one I did in particular was one uh, that I had learned from my now ex-wife, uh, Marina France, uh, from whom I learned a lot about scuba diving, which is why Cassie is a scuba diver. Um, but in particular, uh, a le the legend ab about uh, forest fires. Well, you'll see as you read the story. So, without further ado, the first ever Cassie Zukov story, which is much different from all the other Cassie Zukov stories, How You Can Prevent Forest Fires. Cassie, what are you doing? I wanted to ignore the voice. I knew it was my younger sister, and I did not want to talk to her. Or to anyone else, really. But she hadn't gone away when I ignored her any of the other any other time in the last 18 years, so I was pretty sure that it wouldn't work this time either. I looked up to see her standing in the doorway of the bedroom she and I used to share before my twin brother Paul moved out. Her right hand occupied itself by twirling her not naturally blonde hair. Well, gee, Sonny, I said, I'm checking over the stuff in my dive bag, I'm wearing a bathing suit, and it's a beautiful Saturday morning. What do you think I'm doing? You're going diving, aren't you? I sighed. Your grasp of the blindingly obvious remains strong. I turned my back to her, hoping that now she'd go away. Kneeling down next to the big mesh dive bag, I went on checking to make sure it was all there. Wetsuit, check. Fins, both here. Knife, present. Mask, hood, and snorkel, yep. Buoyancy compensator jacket and regulator, all there. First aid kit, yes. Sunscreen, no. Damn. Have to stop at the drugstore. Cassie, you can't go diving! I snarled, but did not look at my sister as I made sure the dive computer had fresh batteries in it. She could insist on staying, but I was damned if I'd give her the satisfaction of looking at her. Why not? In a tone that implied a duh, Sonny replied, Because there are forest fires! My sister had made a lot of leaps in logic in her life, but none so high so far and so graceful as this one. I gave it a 9.2. Realizing I wouldn't get any peace until she finished whatever loopy train of thought she was on, I turned, put my hands on my hips, and glared at her. Sonny, what are you talking about? Don't you know how they put out forest fires? With water, generally, I said, throwing her duh right back at her. Don't you know how they get the water? can't be that hard. Three quarters of the world is covered in it, you know. They've got these, you know, helicopters with these really big scoops, and they scoop up the water and dump it on the fires. I suppose it was possible. I guess. All I really knew about forest fires was that they were bad, and that there have been too many of them near here lately, both north of us near L.A. and east of us in, the New, Mex in New Mexico and Arizona. We hadn't had any fires here in the San Diego vicinity, at least, but that didn't stop us from getting drought warnings. Sunny wasn't finished. And every time they do this, they always find some divers in the forest burned to a crisp. Make that a 9.5. Who told you this? I asked as I zipped the bag up. That, that skanky guy you've been hanging out with. He told me when he came over last week. You mean Scott? 
Yeah, him and that ditzy girlfriend of his. That would be Gina. And yes, his name is really Scott, spelled X-C-O-T-T, -T, which is pronounced the same as S-C-O-T-T. -T. It's just spelled with an X. We're both victims of ex-hippie parents. In fact, that's why my boyfriend Gary introduced us. His parents named him Scott with an X. Mine named me and my twin Castor and Pollux. And yes, I know that Castor was a guy. Please don't get me started. And named our younger sister Sunflower. Scott was also my mentor in diving. When I first saw the copy of Ocean Realms in Gary's dorm lounge, I realized I had just had to become an underwater photographer. See, I've always loved taking pictures, but never found a subject I liked enough to photograph until I saw that amazing shot of a sea anemone that was taken in Bonaire. Then I knew what I had to do. Or, at least, I thought I did. Scott was the one who told me that I couldn't just go underwater with a camera, I needed to get certified as a diver. Sonny, who thought the whole thing was stupid, said certifiable would be a better word, and get a ton of equipment. It still didn't take long for two reasons. One, we live in La Jolla, California, about six seconds away from the beach. Two, I have very rich, high-powered lawyer parents. They seem to figure they've built up a huge karmic debt from spending their sordid youths, their words, sticking us with names like Castor, Pollux, and Sunflower. So they will indulge virtually every whim we have. When Paul decided to quit college and wander the roads looking for America, our parents sent him off with their blessing and a wad of cash. When Sunny decided she just had to have a Jaguar, she got one. And when I realized that I had to be an underwater photographer, which included a big shopping list of equipment, that list was filled. Scott showed me all the places to dive in the area. He taught my certification course at the dive shop he co-managed with Gina, and he was my buddy on my first few dives. He also introduced me to Dina Rosengauss, a tall Russian woman who, as it turned out, was the one who took the picture of the, the anemone in Ocean Realms. She showed me all the tricks of underwater photography and how it differs from above, the above water kind. Dina also turned me on to a source for a wetsuit that would actually fit. I'm 5'11", and they just don't make wetsuits for Amazons. Of course, except for Dina, every female diver I'd met was 5'2 and petite, so there probably wasn't much of a demand. I moved past Sunny to the bathroom, one of three upstairs, that doubled as my dark room. Cassie, you're not listening to me. You can't go diving. Sunny, you didn't actually believe him, did you? Inevitably, she followed me into the bathroom. Of course I did. He's been diving, like, forever. He knows this stuff. You said so yourself. I had, too, mostly when I first started diving, and Sonny kept asking me thousands of times if this jerk friend of Gary's knew what he was doing. Well, he was probably pulling your leg, I said, as I gave the underwater camera, same as a regular camera mostly, except for the waterproof casing and the huge strobe light attachment, a once-over. I still don't think you should go diving until they put that fire out. I once again barreled past Sonny and went back into the bedroom. She followed, not giving up. Cassie, I... Sonny, look, I said whirling around and putting on my best I'm your older sister and I'm six inches taller than you damn it voice I have had a really fucked up week okay you I have been completely submerged in that stupid Keats paper and when I haven't been doing that I've been taking shit from Liveracos Dr. Liveracos was the professor to whom I was a teaching assistant at the University of California San Diego's Ravel College where I'd been a grad student for a year it looks like next week is going to be even worse so today I'm finally getting a chance to take a break from all of it and I'm going diving period End of discussion. And with that, I turned my back on her, packed away the camera in its bag, hefted it and the dive bag, and, for the third time, barreled past my sister. Okay, Sonny finally said to my back as I went downstairs, but if you get killed, I get your room. It's really hard to describe how much I love diving. Most non-divers don't get it. I mean, I tell people I'm a diver, and they nod and say, Oh yeah, I've gone snorkeling a few times myself, like that means anything. Saying you know about scuba diving because you've gone snorkeling is like saying you know about skydiving because you've jumped off a low tree branch. I'll never forget my first real dive. When you train to get certified, you start out in a classroom, then you go into a pool, and then finally in open water. The pool diving didn't excite me, and I almost gave it up. But then Scott took me into the Pacific for the first time. The freedom is amazing. I mean, yeah, you have to keep track of your bottom time and your air intake and your surface intervals and all that. But after a while, you do that as easily as you walk on land. And you don't think about it. And you just enjoy the freedom. You can move any way you want. You can go over things and under them. The water covers you like the world's biggest flannel blanket. But the best part is the fish. 
so many different shapes, sizes, and colors. The colors are just incredible. There's nothing like it on land. And they just love to dart around you and toward you and under you and over you. And I swear, some of them actually pose for my photographs. And then there's the kelp forests, which just have to be seen to be believed. So, of course, the dive that day was incredibly boring. I just saw a few flounder and a bunch of starfish. It just made me crankier. Probably my last chance to dive for at least a couple of weeks, and none of the fish wanted to come out and play. Not even a sea otter to frolic with. Eventually, I'd had enough. I swam up toward the surface, taking a safety stop at about 20 feet below the surface. Safety stops are three to five minute pauses during your ascent to give the body a chance to shed out any excess nitrogen that's built up during the dive. You don't always need to, particularly after a dive this short, but I don't like to take chances. About two minutes into the stop, I saw a quick glint of something that reflected the sunlight. I turned to see a curved piece of metal coming toward me. In a moment of sheer lunacy, I thought it was a scoop. Oh my god, Sonny was right, I'm going to get scooped up and dumped up on a burning sequoia. Then I came to my senses and actually looked at the thing. It was a hubcap. As it floated slowly downward, I got grumpier, partly because I hated finding crap like that in the ocean, mainly because for a minute I actually believed Sonny's bullshit story. Afterward, I angrily tossed the dive bag into the back of my pickup truck, said goodbye to Gina and the other folks at the dive shop, and went home. Things looked up immensely. Sonny's jag wasn't in the driveway, so she was probably off with her dippy friends pretending to study while really cruising for guys. With Mom and Dad in Las Vegas on business for the weekend, it meant I had our big house to myself. The pictures I took were all of real dull subjects, as develop and so developing them would have depressed me, and the absolute last thing in the world I wanted to do was tackle Keats. So I turned on the computer and checked the scuba diving list on the internet that Scott and Gina had spent ages talking me into trying out. I finally gave in a month earlier and also joined a commercial online service that had a scuba section on it, including weekly live chats on Saturdays. So what's the first message I download? Somebody asking about the helicopters with their scoops that dump water and divers on forest fires. This guy's question resulted in about 25 replies within an hour of the original post, all with the same pissed off tone, all saying basically, don't be stupid except for one guy. His email address was something cutesy, like sea lion at whatever it was dot com. He kept insisting that it was true that his wife died that way. Nobody paid any attention to him, but thinking about it, nobody ever paid any attention to him, no matter what he said. And he posted quite a bit in the last month. I thought it was pretty mean, really. I mean, his wife died. My boyfriend and his sweet mates were throwing a party in their dorm for no real reason that, right, that night. We're seniors, he said. We're supposed to party. I don't remember ever acting like that when I was a senior. But he told me it would start at 9, which meant it wouldn't get going until at least 10.30, so I figured I could hang out in the scuba chat room. Within minutes, I was having a great time gabbing with Anna Bronstein, the sysop, and four other people about how hard it is to photograph parrotfish. Then a guy with the user ID C.Lion joined the chat. Hey there, are you the same C. Zukov who's on the scuba list? I blinked, then typed, yep, that's me. Cool, I just joined up here, good to see a familiar face. It was the same guy. Realized, the one who said his wife died by being scooped. But everyone on the list said that was just a joke. I decided that Mr. Sea Lion had been trying to razz the guy who asked the question on the list, so I didn't bring it up in the chat. At close to 11, I finally logged off. Sea Lion hadn't said a lot, and none of what he did say mentioned his wife or scoops, and nobody really responded to the few things he did say. This made me feel better for some reason. I announced that I was heading off to my boyfriend's party, and everyone said goodbye. We live walking distance from UCSD, which is why I never bothered to get a room on campus. It seems stupid to give up one-fourth of a large house for one-half of a dorm the size of my parents' walk-in closet. So I hoofed it to Ravel College's senior dormitory for the party. I grabbed a beer from the plastic garbage can by the door that was full of ice and Budweiser cans. I couldn't see Gary, but I did see Scott. I said hi, told him about my dull dive that morning, and then asked him why he told Sonny that dumb story. He laughed. Oh, man. I'm really sorry, Cass, but Sonny's just, like, so easy, you know? Gina walked up just then. Who's easy? Cass's sister. After Gina fixed him with a very nasty look, Scott quickly said, I, I mean, she's, like, easy to tease. Remember we got her with the forest fire stories? That brought a smile to Gina's face. Oh, yeah, she bought that one with a credit card. Gina always came up with metaphors that sounded wrong, somehow. I felt reassured after that. Then I asked, hey, you seen Gary? Scott Brown, not for the last few minutes. I wandered around for a while, but no sign of Gary. His roommate, Mike, was acting like an asshole in the middle of the room. Half a beer and Mike was completely plastered. The other four guys who lived in the suite were nowhere to be found, probably off at someone else's party. 
Finally, I gave up and went into the bathroom. That's where I found Gary. He was lip-locked with some bimbo. Neither her hair color nor her chest were the ones she was born with. I stood there with my mouth hanging open. I couldn't actually say anything, but I just kept standing there. They didn't even notice me for like five minutes. Then Gary came up for air and saw me standing there. Oh, I guess. How you doing? He sounded very drunk. They didn't hear you come in. Oh, sorry. This is Bambi. Bambi, this is my friend Cassie. She's a grad student. Bambi. Her fucking name was Bambi. My boyfriend was making out in the bathroom of his suite with a woman named after a fucking cartoon character, and his reaction is to introduce me to her as his friend. You goddamn pissant, pussy-eating, slime-caked, insectoid, neanderthalic fucking shit -head. Then I threw my beer can at him. My, my memory is hazy on what happened next. I think I yelled at him a little. He acted all innocent. Bambi looked confused, probably still trying to figure out what Neanderthalic meant. Then I stormed out. I think I knocked Mike on his ass when he got in my way. It's easy when you're 5'11 and really pissed. I don't actually remember walking home, but I must have. The next clear memory I have is logging onto my computer. Sure enough, the scuba chat was still going on. However, the only two people in the room were Sea Lion and Anna, the sysop. This scrolled by just as I came into the chat room. They finally found her in the middle of the forest. Right there in the middle of the forest. In full scuba gear. I mean, how else did she get there? Oh, God. I didn't type anything until Anna prompted me. Hey there, Cass. How was the party? Thank you, Anna, for changing the subject. Lousy, I typed. My boyfriend is the scum of the earth. We went on for a while about how men are pigs. Mr. Sea Lion didn't say a word until he finally left the room without even saying goodbye. Some others joined the chat, at which point Anna, good sis up that she was, steered the topic back onto diving stuff. When I left, I checked on the email on my UCSD account. There were four. One was from Gary, timestamped from before the party, which I deleted without reading. Two were from the scuba lift. list. The last was from the Sea Lion. Sorry for leaving so suddenly, he said. I just wanted to warn you to be careful. With all the fires over in your neck of the woods, diving might be risky. I don't know what possessed me, but I actually replied to this. I decided to play dumb and ask what possible connection there could be between diving and forest fires. After I sent it, I regretted it, but it was too late. Maybe he'd ignore it. I went down to the kitchen, yanked open the freezer, and was relieved to find that Sonny hadn't touched my tub of chocolate chip cookie dough ice cream. I put a depressing Nick Cave album on the CD player, ate ice cream, and tried to come up with imaginative ways to kill Gary. I didn't get a reply to my email to Mr. Sea Lion for two days, but when I did, it was a doozy. I'd spent Sunday holed up in my room with Keats. Sunny tried talking to me at one point, but I gave her a real nasty look, and she stayed away from me for the rest of the day. I spent Monday on campus helping Liveracos and being surly to anyone who came within 10 feet of me. Monday night, I logged on and found a pile of scuba list email, another email from Gary, I didn't delete it yet, but I didn't read it either, and one from the sea lion. He wasn't kidding. He hadn't been pulling anybody's leg. His wife really was found in full scuba gear in the middle of a forest fire that had been put out in Canada somewhere. The email he sent went on for several pages. It went into all kinds of specific detail, where his wife was found, where she'd been last, stuff like that, most of which I glossed over. My first thought was, it's true. It's all true. My second thought was, get a grip, stupid. You don't know who this guy is. You don't even know his real name. He's probably just a psycho. There's lots of them on the net. I closed the file and read the rest of the stuff from the list. It was a typical day's worth of messages. Luciana had just gotten back from the Cayman Islands and posted the beginning of her trip report. Greg's dive computer turned out to be a lemon, and he posted full brand information so people could avoid it. Glenn and Brandy asked for hotel recommendations in Key West, to which half a dozen people had replied, and the schmuck calling himself The Regulator kept, kept the flame war about solo diving going for yet another day. All typical, ordinary, normal diving talk. No scoops, no charred corpses in forests. Then the phone rang. We have a dedicated modem line, so the call didn't kick me offline, but it took me a minute to locate the cordless. I barely made it before the machine kicked in. Hello? Yes, it's Gina. You seen Scott today? Uh, no. Why? Because I haven't seen him since noon. That's why. His gear's all gone, too. I sighed. Gina, are all the boats still there? Uh, I think so. Let me check. I heard Gina put the phone down, and I put my head in my hands. She didn't even think to check the boats. Worse, if Scott's not around, she's supposed to be managing the dive shop, and she doesn't know if all the boats are accounted for? Well, the boats are all there. 
Gina said when she got back to the phone. But Manfred just told me that Scott had been talking about doing a beach dive. So maybe that's where he is. Sorry to have bothered you, Cass. Hey, no big deal. Hey, did you read Lucienne's trip report yet? From there, we spent half an hour doing scuba gossip. Gina was still pretty worried about Scott, since he obviously went off somewhere without telling her. I thought at first that was pretty mean. I mean, what if something happened to him? But then I didn't always tell Sonny or my parents where I was going all the time. Hell, half the time they'd only know I was gone because the truck wasn't in the driveway. By the time we got off the phone, it was almost two. The Veracos had some kind of family thing Tuesday, so I had to handle the sophomore lit class by myself, and it, start, and it started at 8.30 in the morning. So I undressed and climbed into bed. At one, the phone rang. I'd kept the cordless in my room, so it woke me up. Mr. I said, the closest I could come to, why the hell are you calling me at this hour? Cass, it's Gina! She sounded completely nuts, the way Sonny sounded when she broke a nail. Scott still hasn't come back! Marty and Nick said they saw him do a beach dive at six, and he hasn't come back yet! We gotta find him. Can you get down to the shop? Uh, and bring your dive light! And then she hung up. I stared at the phone for a while, not sure that this wasn't all part of a dream. After a minute, I realized that it wasn't, and that I'd never hear the end of it if I didn't go down to the shop. Besides which, I'd never get back to sleep. I clambered out of bed, put on a bathing suit, started to go downstairs, remembered I need my gear, went back upstairs, grabbed the dive bag, started down again, remembered Gina asked me to bring the dive light, went back up again, rummaged through my closet, found the light, put it in the bag, and then went down a third time. The television sounded from the living room. I went in to find my father channel surfing, various bits of paperwork all over the floor around him. He did this when he had to stay up late working, take occasional TV breaks. Where are you going, hon? He asked, hitting the mute button on the remote. Dive shop, I said, and realized that I sounded like the walking dead. I was not in any shape to dive, much less search for someone who probably had already finished his dive and gone home and didn't bother to call Gina. Maybe he was meeting another woman. It's all the rage these days. Maybe he and Gary had a contest to see who could cheat on their girlfriends more successfully. Or maybe Nick and Marty saw someone else on the beach. Why wasn't I in bed like a normal person? Isn't it a little late for that? Uh, some kind of crisis. Gotta go help. My father frowned. Well, okay, but be careful. Remember, it is a school night. I nodded and started to leave. My father gave me a final concerned look, then demuted the TV. Fires are now under control. One body was found in what was left of an oak tree. Apparently he was wearing some kind of and there can be only one. May it be. Dunk Suddenly I was wide awake. Go back! What? My father asked. Go back to that news thing on the fires. He flipped the channel. I have more of this latest forest fire to hit Southern California in a little while. Up next, headline sports. Then it cut to a commercial. What was it he said? The body was wearing what? Uh, I'm not really sure why. Did he say rubber? I don't think so. Cassie, are you okay? I shook my head. This was insane. Never mind. It's nothing, really. Of course it was nothing. This was just a story, a myth. It didn't really happen. How the hell would they get the scoop onto the helicopters anyway? It was crazy. I went out to the driveway, tossed the dive bag into the bed of the truck, then got in and pulled out. They've got these, you know, helicopters with these really big scoops, and they scoop up the water and dump it in the fires. Cass's sister. I mean, she's like easy to tease. Remember we got her with the forest fire story? Oh yeah, she bought that one with a credit card. They finally found her in the forest. Right there in the middle of the forest. In full scuba gear. I mean, how else did she get there? One body was found in what was left of an oak tree. No, no. It was stupid. Scott was probably off drinking somewhere. It had not been dumped. He had not been dumped on a forest fire. I pulled into the dive par shop parking lot. Several other regulars had shown up and were piling into one of the shop boats. Gina looked the most worried, but everyone seemed kind of nervous. That's when it hit me that Scott could still be lying dead underwater somewhere. And the cops wouldn't be any help. He hadn't been missing long enough. Just because he hadn't been scooped does didn't mean he wasn't in trouble. So a bunch of us went out in a boat. One guy whose name I couldn't remember was fiddling with the tuner on a radio. Our fires continue to rage. Then the guitar riff from some Eric Clapton song or other came on. There we go, he said. Always better to dive with classic rock. We each took an area where we would look for Scott. When we got to my location, I got onto the platform, held my mask and regulator to my face, and started to step forward. Uh, Cassie? I turned back toward the radio fin. What? You may want to put your fins on first. Great, I can't even remember to put the stupid fins on. As everyone laughed at me, I got off the platform, put on the fins, and then stepped off the platform onto the, into the ocean. I felt like I was being smothered. Tonight it wasn't a flannel blanket, it was a pillow someone had shoved onto my head. I turned the dive light on and started looking. Every time the light shone off something metal, I panicked, thinking I was going to get scooped. At one point I even lost my regulator, which would not have been a good thing. Then I'd drown and everyone would be searching for me. Then Gary could feel guilty. Might even be worth it for that. 
Christ cast. Get a grip. I didn't find him. That's probably because he wasn't there to be found. This whole thing was a waste of time. It was just keeping me from getting a good night's sleep. If Scott did turn up alive, I'd probably kill him. We each agreed to search for an hour. After I'd been down for 45 minutes, I headed back up for the surface, giving myself time for a safety stop. As I trod water 20 feet under the surface, the water started churning. I looked up, pointing the light upward. Between that and the almost full moon, I could make out some kind of shape right above the water. I squinted, trying to figure out what the shape was. After a minute, I realized it was a helicopter. Panic started bubbling in me. The water churned more as the copter moved closer to the water. And then it pulled away. The water grew calm again. If I hadn't been wearing a wetsuit, I would have put my head in my hands. The copter was probably there for some legit reason. Maybe Gina had a friend with access to one and had asked him or her to help look for Scott. Whatever it was, it didn't have a scoop and it wasn't about to dump me on a forest fire. This is the last time I dive when I'm half asleep. Five minutes had passed, so I prepared to swim back up to the surface. That's when the tentacle grabbed my foot. I looked quickly down and saw a massive thing that was all scales and teeth. It started pulling me closer. Three days worrying about a scoop, and I get attacked by some kind of crazy sea monster. My regulator came loose as I started to scream. Yep, that was the first Cassie Zukov story, and strangely, it was not the last Cassie Zukov story. I've uh, Some of the later stories do allude to the weird thing she saw in San Diego. Um, and there's also other references to her breakup with Gary and, and other stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's kind of the pilot episode, I guess, of Cassie Sukov. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I, it's really hard to find copies of Urban Nightmares. I did, however, reprint the story in Ragnarok and Roll, uh, the first collection of uh, Tales of Cassie Zukov, Weirdness Magnet. It was uh, in that collection as a bonus track, so you can get it there. Um, find me online at tekendido.net. Read my blog at tekendido.wordpress.com. Please support my Patreon at patreon.com slash crad. And please, stay safe. Thank you.